Hello ladies and gentlemen, Big Daddy Top Hat here, ready to cover one of the most requested topics I've ever had on this channel. As the thumbnail would suggest, it is time to look at easily one of the most distinguishable, recognisable and popular fighting game characters of all time, the enigmatic Terry Bogard, who is not only the face of Fatal Fury and the poster boy for King of Fighters, but the character who has served as SNK's unofficial mascot character for quite some time almost always being the focal point of their crossover games and essentially serving the same purpose of the company as our old pal Ryu does for Capcom. So join me today as I dust off a fingerless gloves and trucker hat and take an extensive look at Terry's origin and storyline history throughout his main franchise. There is no question that he has entered an astounding amount of fighting tournaments over the years. This is quite the story history, so buckle up and get ready to hear all about the rise of this man. This ladies and gentlemen is the story of Fatal Fury's Terry Bogart. Yeah. While today Terry may often be considered the face of SNK, what may come as a surprise to some is that Terry was originally conceived far away from the SNK headquarters, in the Capcom offices of all places during the development of the original Street Fighter in 1987. As pointed out in the past on here, the staff who created Street Fighter would leave Capcom and go on to create Fatal Fury, so Capcom and SNK fighting game history has been tied together since the beginning. Designed by Hiroshi Matsumoto and Takashi Nishiyama during the creation of Street Fighter, as one of the main characters they conceptualised what they believed to be a typical Caucasian American male, wearing a leather jacket. But the idea was scrapped in favour of two playable fighters wearing more traditional martial arts attire. That doesn't sound like something that will ever catch on though, so I doubt we'll ever hear anything more about them. Later, when Matsumoto and Nishiyama jumped ship to SNK, they still wanted to utilise this design for a brash, cool, action hero type American. So they put him in 1991's Fatal Fury King of Fighters as a playable character, and the legacy of Terry Bogard was quite literally born. He was hilariously described by SNK staff as the most macho, standout, original Terry, which may or may not have been spoken by someone in their first language. But given the prevalence of mystical antagonists and protagonists that seemed to be lifted straight from an 80s ninja movie in fighting games of the time, Terry was an extremely original character for the era. Known for his stylish and always well colour coordinated outfits, or fits as the kids would say, and his trademark cries or famous iconic American slogans such as OK and Hey Come On Come On, it was clear that this brilliant super American Terry Bogard was more what Japanese people in the early 90s thought cool Americans were like rather than what they were actually like in reality. Terry's design, arsenal of moves and limited but memorable vocabulary helped him stand out from the pack and laid the foundations for what would become one of the most enduring video game characters of all time and one of the most selected fighting game characters ever. As for the character's in-game backstory, little is known of Terry's biological parents or where exactly he was born, but both he and younger brother Andy were orphaned from an early age and were forced to raise themselves on the streets fighting to survive. They were both soon adopted by martial arts master Jeff Bogard, taking his surname and being raised in the rather descriptive South Town. Alongside fellow students Geese Howard and Cheng Sinzan, Jeff was a member of a highly secretive school, training under Tung Fu Rei. All was sunshine and rainbows for the three martial arts amigos until Sensei Tung Fu Rei was forced to choose between Geese and Jeff as his finest student, and the one who he will ultimately pass all the secrets of the school onto. Sensing Geese's surreptitious evil ambitions and recognising Jeff to be a thoroughly decent chap, he chose Jeff to be his successor, which absolutely infuriated Mr Howard and made him swear revenge. And unlike most Geese, this revenge would not be limited to just breaking someone's arm, as we are about to see. At the age of just 10 years old, while out walking with his adopted father and younger brother, Terry and his family were abruptly stopped by a car in the middle of the road. Out of the car came a crew of Geese Howard's thugs, attacking Jeff with knives, leaving him badly injured and laying in the street. At that moment, Geese himself came out of the car, finishing off the job and murdering Jeff right in front of Terry and Andy, the evil bugger. This would be the moment that the brothers would realise their true calling and dedicate themselves not only to the martial arts, but to getting revenge on the hideously evil and ludicrously named Geese Howard. 
They knew, however, that the incredibly powerful and skilled geese could not be taken down easily, so they made an oath to spend the next 10 years training and preparing themselves to be able to ultimately defeat their adopted father's killer. Taking slightly different routes with their training, Andy chose to study martial arts in Japan to differentiate himself from his older, and let's face it, cooler brother. While Terry remained faithful to the teachings of his father and father's mentor, continuing to develop his style. A decade was passed before the now highly skilled Andy returned to Southtown to reunite with his big bro and start to put their plans of revenge into motion. It was at this time while visiting their father's grave that they met Japanese multi champion Joe Higashi, who would be the one to inform them of the tournament being organised by their arch nemesis Geese Howard himself. This tournament was known as the King of Fighters and would serve as the backdrop to the first Fatal Fury game. The Bogard brothers and their newfound friend would enter the tournament in the hope of taking out the evil geese. And just to clarify one last time, this is the evil geese Howard. There are unfortunately no evil live geese in this game. You have to play untitled goose game in order to get that fix. Which is a bloody shame to be honest. But anyway, although Andy and Joe were knocked out of the tournament, our man Terry went on to defeat all seven of the fighters including his former mentor, Tung Fu Rei, setting up a showdown with Geese at the very tippy top of his tower of crime. Terry was victorious when he landed a spectacular flying kick that Rob Van Dam would have been proud of, sending his bitter rival crashing out of the window to the ground below, Austin sensibly killing him. Cause you know, evil video game crime bosses always stay dead, and there's absolutely no chance we'll ever be seeing him in any future games ever again, or anything. One year later, Terry would hear of a new King of Fighters tournament being run by a mysterious roided up German nobleman by the name of Wolfgang Krauser, which would be the basis for 1992's Fatal Fury 2, a game which is a vast improvement on its predecessor and features a newly sleeveless Terry, with much of the same moveset, but now with far more detail and frames of animation. Ooh. Krauser had decided to go all out for this tournament, electing to adopt global rather than regional battles. It turns out that he also had some strong ulterior motives, as Krauser ends up being the half-brother of Geese Howard, and the whole tournament was essentially serving as a front to lure his evil half-sibling's killer into entering. So he could kill him himself. But not for revenge this time, rather to show the world that by murdering Geese's killer, he was the world's most powerful crime lord. To add even more heat to their rivalry, the unslightly scar on Krauser's forehead was given to him by Jeff Bogard many years ago, giving the gigantic German even more reason to want to smash Terry, Jeff's adopted son, into little bits. It wasn't to be, however, as our man once again overcame the odds and defeated Wolfgang Krauser causing him so much shame he decided to take his own life immediately following the tournament's conclusion. Terry would show up again in 1993's Fatal Fury Special, which was essentially a souped up version of the previous year's Fatal Fury 2, including playable bosses, new moves and combo abilities, returning characters and even a character from another franchise in Ryo Sakazaki from Art of Fighting. At the time, it was seen as the ultimate Fatal Fury experience and served as something of a glimpse into SNK's future, as its non-canon narrative and mix of characters from different fighting game franchises would ultimately inspire the first King of Fighters game, which came out the following year. After a few years of travelling the globe, meeting new opponents and honing his skills, the Hungry Wolf found himself involved in yet another King of Fighters tournament, and as the protagonist of yet another Fatal Fury game. Now, I was never quite sure whether he's called the Hungry Wolf because of his unique fighting skills or just because he's an absolutely massive Duran Duran fan, but I digress. News was beginning to surface that Geese Howard has astoundingly, but also really not bloody surprisingly, survived his fall and was in fact alive and well. This storyline served the main crux of SNK's 1995 classic Fatal Fury 3 Road to the Final Victory, in which we discovered that Geese had used a magical scroll that he was in possession of to survive the fall and speed up his recovery from the injuries he sustained. This scroll was one of three parts of an incredibly powerful artifact that could potentially give Geese the power to take over the world. And what's even bloody worse is that while everybody was distracted with Krauser's tournament, he'd only gone and found the second part as well, leaving only one part of the artifact for him to find. 
Terry got wind of this and began searching for it himself in an attempt to stop Geese getting his grubby wings uh, mitts on it. Terry eventually confronts Geese and once again defeats him, but narrowly escapes the battle scene as he is almost trapped in a burning building. Continuing his search for the scroll, Terry defeats Yamazaki and then the Jin brothers, standing once again as champion, but still without the final artifact. It turns out that Geese also survived the previously mentioned burning building and managed to escape and locate the scroll for himself, cementing his place as the most powerful man in South Town after getting his right hand man, Billy Kane, to secretly destroy all three artifacts so no one else could possibly get hold of them and usurp Gil's position of power. He's certainly a lot smarter than most geese I've met. It was around this time that Terry first became acquainted with Rock Howard, Geese's young son and future protagonist, who Terry correctly believes can find himself on the path of good and righteousness, rather than following in his father's evil footsteps. Basically an actual interesting thought out version of Ray Palpatine from Star Wars. Our main man Terry's next canon appearance would come in December of that same year, as the fifth instalment in the Fatal Fury franchise, Real Bout Fatal Fury, which was released to arcades in Japan. This time, Geese Howard was returning as the King of Fighters tournament organiser, and he was making no secret of his devious desire to exact revenge on all of the inhabitants of Southtown who he felt had wronged him over the years, most notably those pesky meddling Bogard brothers. Many fighters tried and failed to qualify for the chance to topple the evil crime lord, but once again it was our red leather jacket clad hero that prevailed, beating all of Geese's henchmen in the process. Terry stood at the bottom of Geese's tower calling up to him, demanding a final battle, to which Geese was only too happy to oblige. Despite Geese's determination to redeem himself for his former losses, it was Terry whose resolve was stronger as he jobbed the Emperor of Southtown out like the little jabroni he is. In a scene reminiscent of the final scene of the first game, as well as the final scene of Robocop, 1989's Batman, multiple Final Fight games and countless other Hollywood movies, Terry once again knocks Geese out of the window of these vertigo-inducing tower. Only this time he offered out his hand to save him. Being almost as proud as he is evil, Geese rejected Terry's help, pushing his hand away and falling to his untimely doom. This would be the final hurrah for Terry and Geese, at least in the canon story, as Terry's main enemy actually seemingly did die in the fall this time, and has not, at least at this juncture, made a return. Being the awfully decent babyface protagonist that he is, Terry felt thoroughly responsible for Rock Howard's newfound orphan status, which is fairly reasonable seeing as he did just kill his father. Feeling a kinship with the young lad, partly due to being an orphan himself, our guy Terry took Rock under his wing, mentoring him and teaching him how to fight. The next time we would see Terry in a Fatal Fury game, however, was two years later, in 1997's Real Bout Fatal Fury Special, serving as a souped-up version of Real Bout, with all new graphics, a return to two-plane fighting system, and an extended roster. The game also continued the theme of non-canon side games, with the inclusion of Wolfgang Krauser and the ubiquitous Geese Howard, among others. Moving through time, the following year would see the final entry in the Real Bout sub-series, Real Bout Fatal Fury 2 The Newcomers, which saw our man Terry once again battle against the non-canon forces of both Geese and Krauser. Continuing on, 1998 would see yet another non-canon entry in the Fatal Fury franchise, in the form of a Japanese PlayStation exclusive, Real Bout Fatal Fury Special, Dominated Mind. Here we would see Terry going up against the clockwork orange inspired white, who had used his powers of mind control to manipulate the thugs of Southtown, including the man who more than slightly resembles Games Master's Dave Perry, Billy Kane. January 1999 saw a polygonal Terry Bogard retell his original story in the 3D fighter Fatal Fury Wild Ambition, which has been largely forgotten these days, and for good reason. As inauspicious as the game was, it would end up being Terry's final appearance as the main protagonist in a Fatal Fury game. Quite the main event run indeed, but his story would be far from over. Ten years after the death of Geese Howard, the formerly crime-infested city of Southtown is now all peaceful and idyllic, leading to the change in its name to the second Southtown. Most of the original Fatal Fury combatants had hung up their gloves or boots, or whatever fighting game characters hang up when they retire. But good old Terry was still as keen as ever to get into fisticuffs, especially with his new training partner by his side, the now all-grown-up Rock Howard. 
After hearing about the new King of Fighters tournament titled Maximum Mayhem that was about to go down, Terry and Rock both entered believing this to be an opportunity to Rock to find out more about his mother. In a rare Fatal Fury face versus face match, Terry and Rock went mano a mano in the semi-final which Terry shockingly lost, thus handing down the central protagonist torch to his young protege and officially ending his run as Fatal Fury's main man. It has been speculated that perhaps Terry allowed Rock to beat him so he could continue on his own quest to seek out answers about his mum. And as Terry has done less clean jobs than the Prime Hulk Hogan, I can see why people might think that. But I suppose we'll never know for sure. Before we move on though, don't you think it's a bit weird that at WrestleMania 18, another Terry, Terry Belea, aka Hulk Hogan, would pass the torch onto another Rock, as in the Rock. Dwayne Johnson. I seriously doubt that the World Wrestling Federation intended to rip off Fatal Fury, but it is a strange coincidence that is worth noting nonetheless. All of these events transpired in the ridiculously highly revered Garou Mark of the Wolves, which came out in 1999 and is still regularly brought up in Greatest Fighting Game of All Time conversations, which is a fitting way to end Terry's Fatal Fury story. I hope you enjoyed learning all about Terry and his oh so wacky exploits today. Given that it's been 23 years since the last official Fatal Fury installment, it's probably safe to say we're not going to get a new entry in the franchise. But lucky for us, our favourite ponytailed American lone wolf has been whoring himself out for years in all sorts of other games, including within a copious amount of crossovers and within the expansive King of Fighters series, which offers up his own entire video game canon. Considering what a ridiculous amount of video games that Terry Bogard has popped up in, in order to truly do this character justice, I would need to make a follow-up video covering all of his other adventures, as his fighting game career has been truly that expansive and that insane. So, if a lot of people check this video out and find enjoyment from it, I'll be sure to make a sequel. After all, we do not want another Mega Man Legends 3 on our hands now, do we? So share this video everywhere you can if you want to hear more about Mr. Bogard in the future. So, ladies and gentlemen, that was the story of Fatal Fury's Terry Bogard, with the King of Fighters Terry Bogard story perhaps yet to be coming on this channel. Videos like this are in part possible due to the generous support the channel receives via Patreon, so additional thank yous go out to A Murder of Crows, Carl Johnson, Heyo Paulo Lopez, Nostalgia Collector, Ben Haradine, Corey Imar Senior, Rowan Dinch, to Evan Border, Philip Nanf, Azra Archive, Joaquin Varela, Michael Cullix, Ego, Jordan Durant, Ian Boyle, Nick Daniels, Princess Zana, Daniel Daly, Computer Man, House of the Ted, Gary Pinkett, ECU Professor, Johnny Holly, August Piazza, Justin Wang, Capcom vs SNK, Hermes Gonzalez, Man Shovel, Michael Hall, Sang He, Norma Stitz, Langston Miller Noob, Sarah Powell, Vlamink Renee, Marvin Araliga, TOG Driver, Louis Viant, John Bates, David Bow, Chris Fisk, Rick67, Antonio Rodriguez, Craig Jenkins, Synth Spaces, Punk Toast, and everybody else who backs what I do over on Patreon. It is greatly, greatly appreciated. Thank you so much. See you soon.